Welcome. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm here with co-host Gary Farmer. Hey, Gary. Hi, Jacques. Good to see you. And Gary, I know you wanted to do a land acknowledgement at the top of the hour. We record the show in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is originally the home of the Tewa people. So for almost two decades, Cara Romero has made a name for herself as not only a leading indigenous artist, but as a photographer working at the top of her game in, global, in the global contemporary art world, showing you institutions like the Museum of Modern Art and the Met. Currently, her work is on view at the Armin Museum, Museum of American Art as part of Speaking with Light Contemporary Indigenous Photography. Kara Romero, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. And so I guess uh, the first thing we should talk about is the uh, new documentary, following Kara Romero, Following the Light, uh, directed by Kayla Waldstein. And uh, you're the subject of the documentary. I am. And so what, what can you tell us? Was that fun? Was that a, was that a self uh, reflective experience? That um, was an experience that was uh, really transformed by the onset of the pandemic. Um, it was really um, created out of the artist in residency program at the Institute of American Indian Arts here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I'm alumni, along with many other intertribal artists um, that come to Santa Fe uh, to go to school there. It's the only place um, that gives formal art training for native people from all over Turtle Island. So that's why so many of us end up here in Santa Fe is because of the Institute of American Indian Art. Their artist in residency program brings artists, like you said, at the top of their game um, to come be in residence with the students that are going to school there. There's usually a cohort of upwards of 200 native students coming from all over to um, go to school. And I did a residency there uh, and they wanted to create a short documentary from some of, about some of the artists that were um, artists in residence at IA. And it was supposed to be a seven minute um, film and they had received funding for it. But um, when everything shut down with the pandemic, Kayla and I uh, decided we should just, you know, let's keep going with this because the documentary could get so much better if she was able to see where I was from or travel out on my next shoot, which was happening in the Los Angeles area. And so she really took a chance and a deep dive and I, I and the artists in residency program were able to support her with funds to um, continue the documentary pursuit and you know my my part in it was to open up my life which uh, I had never done before I'm a pretty private person um, but all in all it was an enjoyable experience and I thought the resulting documentary was really good yeah Kara uh, the Jimmy Wavy people and that's your uh, grandmother to uh, camera right of you. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that experience growing up in the, uh, I guess you were growing in Southern California, but uh, the whole Mojave Desert experience and how that's impacted your work as a visionary. Sure, so I was born to interracial parents in LA uh, in the seventies and um, shortly after I was born, our tribe had reorganized in the 60s, um, and we moved back. So I really don't have any memories of being born in L.A., um, although my parents were high school sweethearts there in Los Angeles. My dad's Chim Wavy and my mom's a German-Irish beach bunny gal from Southern California, and um, we moved back to the reservation, which is Chimwavy Valley. It's at the furthest edge of San Bernardino County, so deep in the heart of the Mojave Desert. 
uh, but it's located on the California side of the Colorado River. And so one of the hottest places in the United States, but with so much water. So we grew up on, you know, 40 miles of shoreline of what's now Lake Havasu. The tribe was um, flooded out of our ancestral valley with the formation of the dams after the Great Depression, hydroelectric energy, a lot of the tribes and Nevada, California, all along the Colorado River lost their valleys, which were, you know, incredibly important to Native people. That's where all of the agriculture and the game and the basket weaving materials were. And um, uh, the boating and uh, hydroelectric energy was the, the name of the game for the U.S. government. And so they declared our ancestral valley eminent domain and they flooded us out. Um, that was the story of reorganization and coming back in the 60s. Um, we left the place for a very long time. Our ancestral region is much larger. It goes from Las Vegas to um, Hesperia, uh, Victorville, Barstow area in Kern County, all the way down south to um, Parker, Arizona. And we... Um, uh, live up there on a pretty typical reservation out there in the middle of the Mojave Desert. You know, when I was a kid, they built the first 30 HUD homes. Um, my grandma was chairwoman of the tribe. Um, it was kind of like a throwback, I think, in retrospect to like growing up in the 40s and 50s. We all ate dinner together every night. Um, we had, we fished together. We had fish fries. We swam in the lake all day long. Uh, we rode in the back of pickup trucks. <laughs> we, um, you know, didn't wear shoes anywhere, and we we owned the place. Um, we never had to lock our doors. We could just wander down the street and, you know, knock on anybody's door. So I have, um, you know, just really fond childhood memories of growing up there. Uh, not to get too long winded, but my parents split. Um, my mom uh, uh, moved us to Houston, Texas. Um, and so I went back and forth for the next 10 years of my life, 12 years of my life between a public school in Houston, Texas, which was the culture shock you could imagine coming from the reservation and then summers at home uh, with my dad's side of the family. That informs my work in so many ways, um, you know. Uh, getting to see how people from outside of the reservation have very little understanding of modern Native life. Um, you know, it. Uh, I think my work really comes from a mixed race perspective. Um, but growing up on the reservation, um, I have a deep love for my people and a deep understanding of the landscape, of the culture, of uh, the loss of the resilience of the beauty of all of it. And I think that that's what I really set out to um, show people visually becoming an artist. I knew that a picture was worth a thousand words from a very early age. And that was how I was going to relate um, how beautiful we are and how we're, you know, very modern and very contemporary and how we're just as indigenous as we ever were. It's amazing now that the, the lake itself is drying and um, and there's all these reports of what's coming apparent, all the corruption of Las Vegas seems to be coming toward the toward the uh, toward the shore. Uh, I guess that'd be an interesting project to capture some of that. Imagine if it all came back to y'all. But um, uh, that impact and why you studied, uh, I guess, cultural anthropology at the University of Houston becomes pretty obvious now. Yeah, I think I wanted to originally, um, I thought I was going to write the textbook that I never had growing up or be a Native Studies professor. You know, there were just a few outlets um, that that seemed uh, like we had. And, you know, artwork, I was always an artist, but I think it's undervalued and not in our native communities, but I think, um, you know, in, in dominant society, art is undervalued as uh, an intellectual pursuit. And I think native peoples hold art as, you know, the highest form of intellect, you know, basket weaving, beading, traditional arts, you know, there's so much um, intellect 
you know, in all of those arts. And then, you know, storytelling is something that we've always done. Um, and so photography was actually uh, something that I stumbled into um, and ended up, I think in some big circle, being that native professor or teaching people through art, all the things that I thought I wanted to write textbooks about, you know, it shook out pretty early on that I was not a writer <laughs> or a scholar. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad I became an artist. Tara, I want to mention that friend of the show, Lara Evans, is a producer on the movie. So uh, t tell me about working with her. I know uh, every time I've had the chance to work on something with her, I've been pretty excited. Laura and Amber were both great. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we're always looking for as Native educators is content. And this was um, really conceived of as um, curriculum and content in the inspirational sense for young Native artists to figure out what um, living as an artist might look like, you know, from somebody that's, you know, just from a typical reservation in the United States. And I think, um, you know, for one, I just honor them for finding the funds to create that content that's pretty hard to come by for the Native students. And then um, it was just a great experience. They did a great job directing and producing and editing the film. Um, it was really nice to have Native people behind it. I think that there's, you know, a nuanced understanding of what we share and what we don't share. And uh, I think it came across really nicely. Kara, what's the difference between uh, your still photography and, and, I mean, I see so much. Uh, I'm obviously a collector of your work and, and work with you from time to time when I get the chance to be a model. But... Um, how far are you from moving pictures? You know, I, I get asked that question quite a lot. And um, I never think that I can't change into another medium. I think most artists kind of feel like that is um, something that could happen at any time. I think I'm just kind of in this rhythm and as I work with my own creative process. I enjoy finding that one still so often. Um, I think one of the things that I would like to do is to, you know, maybe understand a little bit more about um, the moving film industry. I always see like the director of photography come by on the credits and I wonder about those types of jobs. Um, I did do one documentary uh, a hundred years ago, <laughs> about I think it was about fifteen years ago with my tribe, and I worked as a student um, editor and director. Uh, I think that um, so much of what happens in camera is something that's easily uh, um, interpreted right between the still camera and the moving camera all of the functions of the lens are the same um the editing is very different and i think that i would love to try um directing the photography or maybe even directing a film the editing was not for me <laughs> so it's very arduous work yes indeed i uh... I, I know that the, uh, you know, the, there was a recent headline that read, uh, Cara Romero stands defiant against institutional categorization. <laughs> uh, I wondered if you could explain a bit about that uh, effort and how your photography is impacting the greater arts world in America. Oh, I guess it was just uh, never listening to what anybody had to say or they're not caring about what other people think too much was what my grandma always said. Oh, don't waste your time worrying about what other people think. And that to me was um, great resolve. You know, photography, fine art photography was not something that was collected in museums, you know, 25, 30 years ago, m maybe a little bit. And then of course we know the you know paucity of 
Native women in museum collections and just in art collections in general, you know, so I never really saw myself in that space. Um, and then coming to the Institute in the late 90s, um, photography was really kind of an outside medium to our own culture. Also, you know, it was uh, not considered quote unquote traditional art. And um, I just loved it. I felt like a really healthy compulsion. I was a visual communicator. It helped me like express so much of my experience and what was inside of me and things that I thought about in a really abstract way. And so I just pursued it. And I think at some point, never thinking I was going to make it or that there was no place for me was maybe liberating, you know, because then I was just making whatever the hell I wanted. And um, that was truth. That was truth that was recognized in our community, you know. So when my artwork was first really well received, um, it was within our own community. It was, you know, sense of humor. It was seeing ourselves in a way that we recognized and, um, you know, that had our nuanced sense of humor, right? And uh, then it just kind of snowballed after that. And I do find myself a lot not worried about the end game with the pieces. You know, it's really about taking care of whatever that, you know, spirit is that's coming through us and being like, you know, I have to finish this piece because it's what's calling to me right now. Um, whether you want to call it your muse or your creative process or you know, your, your ancestors, you know, speaking through you, um, that's the most important thing to me. And so if that defies categorization, then that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time I was exposed to your work at a market situation here in Santa Fe, and um, it was the whole water memory series. And that, uh, you know, I eventually captured one of those images from that whole series of work. And how that all, you know, I just read recently how that came, all came to you in a way. Can you tell us a bit about that journey early into your career, a little earlier, halfway maybe? <laughs> yeah, no, it was, um, you know, it's interesting. There was, uh, a, I had a, uh, I found my voice about a decade ago. And I think that that's what I was describing, you know, right before. And um I could tell that the work that I was making was being really well received in a way um, that I had not experienced before with my own community. And I wanted to make more. Um, I had gone through one of those really dark periods in life. Um, and it was one of those that, you know, kind of broke me, but I came back stronger. And artwork was like my main focus after that. I was like, you know, I've been given this gift and I'm, I'm never going to not do it again, you know. And I was really just, you know, kind of with that same sentiment, doing it out of love, doing it because it was my passion. Um, and my husband is an artist, also Diego. And, you know, he was asking me about things that were holding me back here and there, Sometimes it was like, well, why don't you do that? You know, and I would say, oh, well, I don't have the equipment that would do that. And he would say, well, get the equipment. And that for, I think, a woman um, and a Native woman was something that we grew up with kind of like scarcity, right? You know, like, oh, well, you know, I'm worried about how I'm going to feed my kids. Is it appropriate? Is it too frivolous to spend money on a camera? And when I figured out that is not frivolous to invest in yourself, I think that that was a game changer for me as a Native person, that it's okay to spend money on your artwork and these things that you really, really believe in. Um, and Water Memory was the first time that I had really done that. You know, it was renting underwater equipment. It was, you know, renting a space to have... Uh, so it was my whole life savings, you know, it cost me a little over $2,000 at the time, maybe between two and $3,000 of my hard earned savings to make that piece. It was scary for me, um, but it was what was in my mind. And, uh, you know, it just turned out beautifully. Um, I, I rented underwater equipment for my camera 
And we um, went and worked in a swimming pool for a couple of days with, you know, some really close friends that had been affected by flooding the way my tribe had been, whether it was historically affected by flooding, like, you know, there's a lot of tribes that were flooded out of their ancestral valleys, or if they were experiencing flooding because of climate change, there's just such a, you know, so much about water and our relationship to water that that's what those pieces were uh, really inspired by. And, um, well, I made my money back, that's for sure. <laughs> and, um, you know, seven years later, that piece was in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's in the Eamon Carter that you were referencing earlier. And it's a really, um, it's a good story. Yeah, Kira, I mean, a lot of us, I mean, I'm an indigenous person as well. I come from the Great Lakes. I'm a, from a different culture. And uh, I think with that, imagery of uh, the water memory uh, effort and in, in relationship to water had such an impact is because, you know, I've been a, a stranger in a, a strange land, even though I feel very comforted into the Pueblo experience. And, uh, and of course, you as uh, Jimmy Wavy uh, married into the Pueblo experience that how much of that uh, infected that or impacted that particular effort as well, because it's obviously a, a you know social dance effort, uh, uh, you know monthly dances we have, ceremonial dances within the pueblo culture here in New Mexico. Um, so, you know, deep conversations around the house about um, the appropriateness of of um, being underwater. Um, it was kind of cutting edge or or pushing the envelope, I guess, if you will. And so we just had a lot of conversations about what we were trying to say, which was really about um, the flooding um, that was happening after the Los Conscious wildfires. And um, there was actually three in the series of water memories. The one with the Pueblo corn dancers became really the most um, recognizable or or popular of the three. Um, but there was also another one uh, underwater of um, Amanda and Hidatsa Arikara from Lake Sacagawea, and then another one from Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma with um, the Tiger Girls, right, with Lisa and Cricket. And so the three together make the series of water memories. Um, you know, it's such an honor to live here um, in Pueblo territory. Uh, it is a place, being a desert person um, and coming to the high desert, it is an extraordinary place. And I feel very lucky um, to, to be here and to have Pueblo children um, and to see how much they fought for to keep, um, you know, their culture and their language and their waterways intact. Um, I'm I'm continually amazed by uh, the strength and the resilience and the beauty and the power of you know the intertribal Pueblo people. I saw that your is that your son that recently sang the uh, national anthem in the uh, uh, Native American days in the Capitol. He did. He did. <laughs> He's um, all, well, my two, I have three children. Um, one is a dancer. Uh, she's graduating this year um, from New Mexico School of the Arts, which is an amazing school um, that brings uh, students from all over the state into Santa Fe and they go to academics the first half of the day and then they make art. They do their art the second half of the day. My 16 year old son, is a singer and a visual artist, um, but he's just got this voice that, you know, uh, it's a rarity. And so I wouldn't be surprised if he's one of the first Native American opera singers, um, but they were looking for American Indian Day, a, a Native person to sing the national anthem. And, you know, lo and behold, there's <laughs> this young boy that has this you know, tenor operatic voice. And, oh, we were so proud. I turned around after I filmed it and both of his dads were crying. <laughs> so it's a powerful experience. With the, as it was with the Native Color Guard also. It was very powerful. 
I know a lot of the work uh, post uh, water memory and, and you, you went into a lot of directions, of course, but one of the directions I experienced was this concept of movie posters of, of trying to create uh, images that reflected uh, uh, our stories in a way. Can you tell us more about that experience? Because mine, uh, which I think has only been screened once or shown once in one uh, specific, but I think you have a larger tour plan for some of that work. Yeah, I loosely um, refer to that body of work as Americana. And it was really, um, I heard this great word the other day that was uh, time blind. And I think I have that time blindness because I often am, you know, making images where I'm you know, thinking non-linearly, you know, and sometimes I like to pull from different eras. And I think one of the things that was really present for me growing up and having that bicultural experience was this idea of absence, like in the sense that we never saw ourselves in all of these subcultures or things that were happening in Americana and then our presence in our households. And I had like a shoebox of photos of my grandma with, you know, dahlias in her hair and dressed in the height of the fashion of the 40s and 50s, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think so many of us have um, that duality. Like, where were we, you know, during these, you know, crazy spaghetti Westerns, you know, or these eras of film noir. And I think, you know, that bouncing from that to like playing cowboys and Indians when we were little kids, I remember how this like deep memory of nobody wanting to be the Indian, right? And, and because they always lost, right? In all of these movies. And so this idea of recreating movie posters with presence and with native people as protagonists is not a new conversation between native people. Like we need more reference to us cast as the protagonist, as the lead roles. And so um, that's what the series was kind of born of, is kind of going back through time and looking at some of these genres and then creating narratives that um, are pro-Native, you know, that are, with, you know, that we're the protagonist, whether that's the anti-hero or, or whatever in the image. And, and I think it brings up for me um, how sometimes in American, not like in recent American history, how quickly we were cast as dumb or as uh, evil, you know, and I, you know, just so nonchalantly, you know, like we get cast in these roles. And I think that was for me also like really wanting to like, you know, cast us as the cool person, right? And maybe cast the non-native people as you know, just the antagonist in the story, because I think that that's, you know, another point of view that we don't get a chance to talk about. We get- I remember that specifically with a film called Fargo. Uh, at the time, probably one of the most popular filmmakers in film culture in America, the Coen brothers, a really respected artist. And I never forget because I auditioned for the role, but my friend got the part, and I knew that his voice was dubbed because he just wasn't mean enough for them. And, and if you look at the film kind of critically, you can see that the Indian is really the cause for for all the bad that happens in that film. And I was really impulsed by that, you know. I. I no longer really watched much of their work after that. I, I just thought, here's the brightest young filmmakers in America, and they're still working from old information that we got in grammar school. You know, they, they haven't matured past that. And it was a real dark moment for me as a, as a performing and an actor, you know. I think, you know, we internalize all of those you know, whether we, we think about it regularly, I think, um, you know, they're humiliating and they're traumatizing. And, you know, we come from a generation that is not silenced anymore. You know, I know my grandma didn't have the privileges that you and I have, 
you know, it was it was just kind of understood that people were surviving, you know, that they were, um, you know, really trying to make a life for their kids. But, you know, all of those things, it's, I think, a really good time to kind of like, let's unpack some of these things and talk about um it, you know, it feeds into everything. Like, yes, you know, native mascots are racist. You know, when people dress up and paint their faces and all of the abhorrent behavior that results from, you know, having a native person as a mascot or a caricature, like that stuff affects our kids, you know, and that stuff affects things like alcoholism and suicide rates. You know, it's not disconnected. They have a, a much deeper impact than I think people realize when you so nonchalantly cast people as, you know, unintelligent or antagonistic, those types of things. Yeah, Kara, I, I know that you also put some effort into working kind of exclusively with Native women for a while, I guess, because we live in such a paternalistic society. Was that what really drove you to kind of and also the traditional arts just comes so vividly through a lot of your still work you want to speak on that a bit sure so um i mentioned earlier that my grandma was chairwoman of the tribe and i think if you dial it back even a little bit more you know we have such diversity with all of our different tribes and the way that they're governed um, but I think one of the things that's pretty unique about being Chimwevi is that our creator is female. Um, and we have a really um, strong sense of women's leadership. Um, oftentimes our tribe is governed, sometimes dominated um, by women in governance or on tribal council, as they say. Um, we're just taught from a really young age that we have inner strength and are powerful. And we have a great amount of, I guess you call it gender equity in our tribe. Our Chimwebi women might be even a little bit tougher than the men, <laughs> to be honest. And so I just always grew up with this um, sense of I could do anything and I didn't have to ask permission or, um, you know, maybe... Uh, it was a unique experience that I wish that other women have. And so I think when you're an artist, there's a lot of, you know, even if you're you're photographing other people or making a film or whatever your artwork is, there's always going to be your own experience and autobiography. Um, I see women, Native women, as incredibly powerful people that have, you know, spirituality and have medicine and life-giving and, you know, um, the ability to govern and really the backbone of many of our Native communities. Um, you know, women are really holding it down. And uh, I think, you know, that conversely, we have... Um, epidemics of missing and murdered indigenous women. And I really look at some of those issues and I'm like, it's because of the same stuff that we were talking about earlier. It's because we've been dehumanized, right? In our portrayals, you know, it's almost like we don't really exist in all of our strength and our power. We have this lived experience of what we know as native people, native women are. And then we have this outside like, disconnect and misunderstanding. And when Native women are dehumanized or objectified or exotified or what all of those words are, um, you know, it leads to problems, you know, it leads to, um, you know, us not being able to keep our women safe. And so women take a really strong central role in my pieces. It was how I was raised. Um, it's what I believe in. I see beauty and I see power in our Native women. And as many of those stories as I can tell, I hope counter that narrative of, you know, lowbrow art of Native women or um, dehumanization of Native women so that they come across as, you know, strong and powerful. I can't believe the transformation. I mean, I've kind of watched Cricket grow up here in Santa Fe over the years and and to see her featured in your work now is just profound, you know, to see where she's at just physically in terms of her own talent and her ability to to work with you to bring out these such strong images. What's the plan for the future in your work upcoming years and time? Um, 
I hope I get to work with my daughter more. My daughter is cricket and uh, she is um, just a really powerful human being. And she really transforms on film. Um, it's always nice to have a deeply intimate connection with the people that I'm working with because, you know, we can take a deep dive and I can really get their personality um, to, to show through. Um, and a lot of these like editorial fine art pieces, um, you know, the future holds right now a lot of the same. Um, I'm really ambitiously trying to make as much work this year um, as I can. I'm working on that idea of Americana um, to finish out that series. I'm finishing out a couple of other series, the first American girls. Um, my hope is to go back home and do some more California pieces. Also, um, in 2025, uh, I will have my first major solo show. Um, at, we'll start at the hood and it will travel throughout the United States and then over to uh, Europe. Um, that's a big deal um, for any artist. And I'm trying to make as much new work to go into that show because uh, there's going to be a book that comes along with it. And that will be my first book. And those are little girl dreams come true. Um, if you wanna see new work this year, um, there's always a big show at Indian Market here in Santa Fe. And I will leave that up throughout the fall. Um, it'll kick off the Thursday before Indian Market, um, which is this year, August 17th um at the 333 Montezuma and you can see new works that will go into the book and into the show and that's what's going on for me thank you so much for your time Cara Romero thank you so much for having me and highlighting the work and the movie and the gallery well it's been a great pleasure to come back to Film Talk Weekly I've missed you all we'll see you again soon